So welcome everyone to the last event of this academic year. It's already the last event. Damn, time flies. I hope you guys are all doing well and it makes me happy to see new faces again. It's always fun to see new people come in. So uh, I already explained that you can find the emoticon face on the bottom left of your screen. So this is a way to communicate with Leo during the presentation. Um, yeah, let me tell you briefly about us. Top right. Yeah. So I'm Evelyn and I'm leading the research team together with Anthony. Anthony is flying all the way in the back. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, good to see you, Anthony. <laughs> um, and the idea of uh, VR researchers came to life during the beginning of the Corona crisis. Doing research is not easy, especially not when, with a pandemic going on. And, and our idea is that with the help of a community, it really gets more easier and fun. Um, that's why our mission statement goes as follows. Research, the Researchers in VR is an online XR community that supports academic researchers and industry professionals by hosting all space VR events. And we would like to encourage knowledge sharing, collaboration, discussion, and as assisting with research activities. Think about participant recruitment or data collection. Um, we, will, we are not doing this all alone. We are here with a whole team. We just expanded a bit with some new team members. So throw up some hearts if you're a team member, so people know who you are. And these, these guys help with organizing these events, moderating uh, meetings and giving workshops. So without them, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you so much, team. Um, yeah, so the, this is the last event of academic year. We hosted 46 events this academic year alone and are going to continue mm. this after the summer stop. And our next meeting will be at September 6th. Mm. But today we are here with uh, Leonard, um, I always call him Leo, <laughs> right? Uh, and Leo will give a presentation about his research about detecting attention in VR. He's an amazing young software developer from the Netherlands whom I have the pleasure to work together with. He's also working with Sirius VR for Sirius VR, a company that develops VR training for technical vocational education. So Leo pre uh, previously graduated from Sexion with a topic of eye tracking for virtual reality. And during this presentation, he will share some of his insight with us. So, yeah. Leo, the stage is yours. Take it away. Okay, cool. cool. Uh, yeah, I'm super excited. It's the first time for me presenting in VR, so please feel, uh, yeah, a bit forgiving for me. Um, yes. So, like Evelyn already started, I freshly graduated game engineering, and um, I'm really fascinated by XR and immersive media in general, and especially when those technologies are for educational purpose. Um, I'm working for Series VR, which are doing uh, industrial virtual reality trainings in various fields. But currently, the company takes a new direction into trying to, besides having real assessors in their training, also having um, like a training performance analysis based on the actions you do in the training. So then, kind of the training grades you. But that's also in addition, obviously, to real assessors, and. Um, the problem with that is that um, uh, performance indicators are not always concrete actions taken by the trainee. For example, if you do your car examination, you will not just grade it by how you drive, but also did you like uh, put attention on the right things? Did you look left and right in the right situations? And those things are difficult or impossible to track currently without relying on an assessor. So um, my research pretty much was about in what way can eye tracking data be measured during a virtual reality experience to enable deeper insights about the trainee's attention. Um, in general, eye tracking, of course, is a technology that um, uses a reflection of the infrared light on the corner, the camera inside that, that detects a reflection relative to the pupil position. Because of the fact that everyone has slightly different eyes, Every user needs to go through a calibration process. Also, for this research, I use the HTC Vive Pro I, so that's a uh, uh, virtual reality headset that also requires to have a PC, which has a uh, really good eye tracking inside already. Um, the data that can be retrieved from the eye tracking device is eye openness, pupil dilation, gaze origin, and gaze direction. For my research, the gaze direction was the most important one. I'll also tell you soon why. Um, the gaze direction is uh, represented as a three-dimensional vector. 
So you can see a, a representation in Unity. It's a game engine that we develop our virtual reality trainings with. Um, you can get from the API the application programming interface that I used. It was possible to get left eye, the right eye, and the combined one. Did some research, and most people that try to uh, track attention using the gaze direction use the combined one because it, yeah, you can avoid lots of complexity. And in most cases, both eyes are focusing the same point. Then you use a interpolated version between the left eye and the right eye. And this is retrievable in Unity as what it's called a raycast. It's also important because obviously we not just need the gaze direction, we need the gaze direction with regards to the general head tracking and the position of the user. And uh, the application programming interface that I used already had this implemented, so that was pretty handy. Um, then the next thing you need in your game engine is objects of interest, which serves for context for the gaze direction. So we want the gaze direction to intersect with, um, with objects. So those are game objects in Unity, and they need a collider. And then it's a little bit, because you also need colliders for other things. If you have an interactive training environment, you kind of need to make sure that those colliders are on a different layer, the different layers, so they, that the eye tracking, uh, the gaze direction only intersects with colliders on the, from the eye tracking layer. Um, and another thing that always comes up when people talk about eye tracking is heat maps, and they're like a really nice visualization of eye tracking data, and they're used by researchers to evaluate eye tracking behavior, but you need someone to evaluate them. And since my company was looking for a solution to automatically find, uh, like, track if someone intentionally looked in an object or not, it wasn't really suitable to use a heat map because then you need a researcher or scientist who evaluates that. Um, so, what's the technical base? And now the most important thing visual attention, which is defined as the process of selecting a sub from all the obtainable information for further processing. So pretty much we have a lot of information and we kind of uh, filtering out certain parts of that. Um, and there, when it comes to eye tracking, multiple attention indicators, blink rate, pupil dilation, and eye movement. For this research, because I also could obviously not focus on all of three, I took the eye movement with the reason of that blink rate and pupil dilation, there's research about that, that those of those things are already heavily influenced by um, VR. So pupil di dilation is different when people have VR headsets because of the brightness and stuff, and it's difficult to uh, get clear results on that. Same with blink rate. Um, obviously, the blink rate is obtainable through the eye openness variable, so then you can kind of write an algorithm to see, okay, how often was the eye closed, and then you obtain the blink rate. Um, so when we talk about eye movement, the most important thing that we that I wanted to filter out are fixations, which are usually correlated with attention. Fixations are an eye movement pattern where the eye remains in one position for a certain amount of time to clearly perceive information. Depending on the type of information, this duration can differ from 50 milliseconds up to 300 milliseconds. And usually all the researchers uh, that I found use a final fixation if the dispersion between the directions in this time frame is below two degrees. And there is the opposite movement type, a saccade, which where the eye moves quickly and is not capable of uh, clearly perceiving information. This haven't filtered out. I only, um, I only looked for fixations and uh, kind of assumed that anything else between was a saccade. Um, so now it's uh, kind of the main core of my research is, and I cannot really talk about it because it's also a um, corporate uh, yeah, property. It's the actual algorithm that I wrote to detect fixations in VR out of the raw base direction, pretty much. And it's a bit more complicated. I will talk about it a lot, uh, a bit. Um, that if you compare it to uh, eye tracking, normal eye tracking, it's super easy. Because normal eye tracking mostly is to sit in front of the screen and I have this thing and then they just see where is the eye on this two-dimensional thingy. And because the head position is always the same, it's pretty much just comparing the gaze directions and then using a calculation to figure out if it's below two degrees. It's pretty easy. The problem in VR is that we are in a 3D environment. That means the head 
can have different positions for different gaze directions. You cannot just compare those three gaze directions that you have to take the, uh, the um, average head position into account. There are a few, when, when I did this research in September, I found two papers that were trying to explain how um, station detection works. They're, in VR, there are multiple approaches and it requires a lot of data. And that's also the reason why you don't find a teammate solution for this. Because for normal eye tracking, OB, for example, the company that also makes the eye tracking for the HTC Pro Vive I, but their normal eye tracking devices have a software that has that already in that they will detect fixations for you. VR, there is no such a software yet. Only some research papers, and I kind of put it together from that. It's also requires a lot of data. It's not super handy to have right now, but I think in the future there will also be an automated solution for this. But uh, the math behind it, it's not too complicated. It just requires a lot of data and it's pretty uh, heavy on, on that side. Um, so last but not least for me, and that's a pretty important point, uh, I really believe in the future of eye tracking for VR for the simple reason of that it's, I think it will at some point uh, the eye tracking solution because of those reasons. Um, through, through VR, we can simulate everything, um, every, every type of situation is possible to simulate through VR, and therefore we can influence the context. Um, give an example. Um, while normal eye tracking, which is also not just used, right? Normal eye tracking is mostly used for marketing reasons. Um, they use it to make people observe websites and stuff. But if you would, for example, want to know how do people perceive billboards, that would be possible only in VR. You could have a scene with a car going by a billboard, and then you could detect fixations on that. And that would be, uh, gives you way more possibilities. And that's why I think that eye tracking for VR is the future of eye tracking in general. I already found research papers as well, where people even use VR eye tracking to simulate normal, uh, uh, the situation of people sitting in front of a PC or looking in front of a screen, which would normally be exactly what you would use normal eye tracking for. Yes. And there we're already uh, done with my presentation. Uh, if you guys have questions, let me know. Thank you, Leo. Let's give him a round of uh, VR applause. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Thanks for the presentation. I'm sure cool. we have Thank a lot you. of questions. I have some questions for you. So I will activate the raise hand button. Um, if you are not familiar with that yet, guys, in the bottom right, you will see a button called raise hands. You can click on this button so uh, you can ask a question. Uh, I can put you down on megaphone so the whole audience can hear your question and then Leo can answer the question. So if you have any questions, please click that button and I will give you the megaphone. So first of all, well, go ahead. Thank you. Now, um, you're, you've, you've had the eye tracking. Maybe I missed something because you went very fast. It's, oh, sorry, you have yeah. it set up in Unity. Um, what about the headsets? Which headsets will work for eye tracking? Because I know most won't. So what we use was the HEC Vive uh, Pro Eye, which is the okay. pretty expensive one, which has eye tracking from Toby implemented one was the use I used for this research. And I also know that the the um, HP Reverb G2 has eye tracking as well as their new Omniceptor version has not only eye tracking but also pulse. And I was wondering if, if how that kind of tracking would when added to eye tracking if pulse tracking and facial movement tracking, how those would combine with your research and the work you're doing? I think that's a super exciting question. It's not just those things that you mentioned, but also blink rate and pupil dilation. If you would use them in addition to, to fixation detection, then you would obviously your results would be more valuable than just detecting fixations. Because the thing with fixations is also they're exciting because of the point that you kind of, if someone, uh, uh, in, attentively looks at an object, you will have a fixation detected with my algorithm. That's for certain. Of course, this doesn't always mean that he really, you cannot 
100% proof that he was attentively looking. But if he attentively looked, you will get the fixation. And that's kind of unique in terms of biometrics. Most biometrics is always really vague and it's kind of based on a lot of influences. But with fixations, you at least know that if the guy looked, you will have a fixation. You will not have the situation that someone looks at something attentively, observes something, and you will not have a fixation. That will not happen. Wonderful. But Thank of course, you. Of course, yeah. Of course, the more stuff you would add with pulls and stuff, the, the better it would get, obviously, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Laurel. Awesome. Uh, next question comes from Luca. Go ahead. Where are you, Luca? Let's see. Is Luca still here? Oh, you're here. I, I do see you. You're in the front. Let's try that again then. Um, one second. All right. If you accept the megaphone, we can uh, hear you. Yeah, this works. <laughs> all right, that can happen. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, all right, next question comes from Anthony. Go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you yet. You're still muted. I see you're struggling, so I will give you some time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. Anthony, I will come back to you. Is that okay? I know you're still muted. Yeah, I can see you. All right, I will continue. <laughs> okay, let, let me try that again later on. All right, so next question is from Matt MG. Go ahead. Where are you at? Yeah, do you. Hang on. Oh, over there. Yes, we hear you. Got it? Okay. Mm -hmm. You see the application for eye tracking of collecting data of what, what users are observing, or is it actually going to be a feedback into the application itself that based on what they're looking at is going to redirect their motion or their attention or their their action or something like that i'm just trying to understand what you know what your application would be so for series vr it's they want to make sure that the train observe certain things at certain points so for example you have a have an electric cabinet and they want to make sure that you look at the warning light before you open it or that you look at the display before you do it with fixation detection you can do that and then based on that you could grade a trainee you could say like oh he didn't look there before he did this action and that's the idea about it okay I, I get it now that's that's very interesting thanks thanks for the question all right let's try again anthony go ahead let's see if it works You should have megaphone now. <laughs> he texted me. He solved the issue. So let's see if if we have solved it. A megaphone. Am I yes. on megaphone now? <laughs> you did oh, it. <laughs> That's a weird one. You, for I'll, I'll have to explain. For those of you who are familiar with AltSpace VR, you can change the settings so you can move your controls around so they're not always in the same spots. I moved them so far to the side that I every time I rotated my head, they moved more, and I couldn't get my controls back. <laughs> Oops. Anyway, hey, Leo, great presentation. Um, I have worked with Toby eye trackers before, and I, I've done some research with them, and, and I, it's really some really fascinating work that you can do. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about sort of a follow-up on the last question, actually, is a vision for where this is going. You said this is kind of the future, and you talked just now specifically about what your company's mm -hmm. interest in doing this is for, but do you, can, can you share with us like a broader vision? What will this software do, you know, this eye tracking? How can we use that in video games and other types of applications, how will it, you know, do you have a vision for where that will go and what, what it can be used for? So I think there are two, two things. First of all, it's, and that's what eye tracking is mostly used. And that's not what my company is doing right now. The most reason for eye tracking is evaluating an experience or evaluating a marketing product or evaluating the product, right? Like 
have uh, you collect data from people and then you see how do they react to this. What we did, and that's kind of really special use case for it, is evaluating the training itself using eye tracking. I think the real future, the broad future lies by evaluating the product by seeing, okay, how do people react to this billboard or how do people react to this advertisement or to this game? Or for example, when you would have a game and collect eye tracking data, you could be like, okay, the first looks there, but actually the more interesting part should be there. So what can we change to make him react like this? Or how do we have right. to adjust the UI to make it like, yeah, easier for him to use? That's I think the main, still the main, uh, the, the biggest uh, point of eye tracking and not evaluating the actual user of the software, which, what we do, which, which is also exciting. But it's, uh, I think that's not the mainstream use case. That makes sense. All right. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks for the question. All right. Um, Paul. Mm. Yeah. You're our own um, megaphone. Hey. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. We can. Okay. Yes, you, you met Leo, you mentioned use of it in marketing. But uh, you know, uh, how can you differentiate why someone looked at something? Is it horror or wonder? You know, a beautiful woman versus a motorcycle crash. Uh, maybe looked at uh, through eye tracking for the same length of time. Is there any That's link an to the emotion? It's an interesting question, but I think that would require way deeper research than what I have done. Because me, for me, it's literally just seeing if someone uh, recognized something. Did someone uh, uh, intentionally looked at something? But why was it like this? And that would be also the next step. Maybe pulls and stuff like this would also add up to this other biometric that you can measure. But that's really mm -hmm. beyond my research. But it's an interesting question. Of, yeah. Awesome. Thanks for the question. All right, we have another question. Here you go, academic. Matthias. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Right. Um, follow up question actually to Paul. Um, how do you see um, your solution being integrated to other um, tracking uh, technologies such as facial, facial recognition? and uh, micro expressions and uh, movement, haptics actually, for instance. Now that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure if I can answer that because uh, it's, uh, I haven't put that much detail into other technologies. I think with biometrics in general, if you add them and if you also would gain knowledge about what, what kind of peaks do you have to detect for those other things that you mentioned, then you could put them together more clearly and especially for for the main purpose, which I've explained, marketing reasons and stuff, then you have, would have a researcher that can look at all this data and he can also make assumptions, assumptions by himself, not just like I did. Uh, what, what, what makes my um, research kind of special is that I developed an automated algorithm that automatically detects uh, attention without having another assessor looking over it. But with those things you mentioned, if you have a uh, researcher, a scientist that that has those data and that that he can uh, that he can process like that a human process that data then obviously you can make way more deeper assumptions about everything also the things with like which emotion does it trigger and stuff but that's obviously way beyond what my automated solution is capable of right but interesting question yeah thanks all right next up steph go ahead Yes, forgive me if this has been asked before, but um, do you think that your what you're working on will someday be used for eye training uh, for people, say, with strabismus or, or other alignment problems? They could tell whether they were being uh, used in unison or not, the, uh, they're both pairs of eyes. <laughs> um, I do think for those who don't have that much, I, I kind of understand the general idea of your question, but also understand that I don't, those medical things, it, it's not really my specialty, but I do think for those things, it's always better of having a person. Like you would have, you would uh, gather the data and then you would have a scientist, a doctor evaluating this data and he will make mm. way more precise um, 
valuation because he knows a lot more context than my algorithm does, right? My algorithm is just like bland in a way. It's capable of detecting fixations, but for more insights, human, human from the field, from the science will always succeed way more, I think, and especially for medical reasons where so many influences can have that thing. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it will, if that will happen sometime at some point that an algorithm is also capable of having all those things, I think it will still take some time. Thank That's you. Interesting question. Yes, for sure. Um, and if I may, I also have a couple of questions. So sure. you are talking about um, blink rate, right? What does it actually say um, if a person blinks a lot? Can you tell a little bit more about um, that? Blink rate is supposed to go down when people pay attention. It's a gen. It goes generally down when people pay attention. It's, there's so many reasons why the blink rate can go down, especially because the blink rate is already influenced often in VR itself. People tend to have different blink rates in VR, depending also on the mm -hmm. brightness and stuff. But uh, yeah, I would also, to be honest, have to read into this a little bit more before I now give like wrong assumptions on that. Mm -hmm. All right. Interesting to hear that it goes down when people pay attention. I think that's uh, We have case. another. All right. We have another question coming in from Laurel. Go ahead, Laurel. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, dear. There. All right. Um, Unity now has the SPI feature, and, and many are, are adding that capability to their Unity projects. Are you familiar with that? No, I've never heard about it. Can you? Can you okay. Uh, so, in a, in a, yeah. All right. So, um, it's a single passed instance is what it stands for. And what it means is in Unity, it used to be that when an object was generated in a VR headset or 2D, it would generate um, one, literally one eye would load in the information and then the second eye would load in. So it would, it would alternate back and forth, but it would be like one complete thing and then another complete thing and another complete part. So the colliders basically would load individually. SBI allows... I guess the best way to explain it is pixel by pixel. So it does I1, I2, I1, I1, I2, but pixel by pixel instead of clunk by, you know, lump by lump. And they're finding that that has an amazing impact on frame rate as well as motion sickness because it's not f filling up larger things. Your brain is not interpreting a, a bigger chunk in one eye and then the same chunk in the other eye and back and forth. Okay. There's less because it's coming in almost simultaneously in both eyes, almost. Now, how, so hopefully that metaphor explained so, so, so what, what just, that was. What, what I understood now is that mm -hmm. this technology is closer, like that renders the objects closer in the way that the eyes interpret it. So it's easier yes. for the eyes to read that out. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, okay. with that information, because again, if you, if you don't understand it, then it may not be an answer. But I was wondering mm -hmm. how that rendering may impact eye tracking because the brain directs the eye before the eye actually sees. I do think even if I don't know that much about that technology, or to be honest, I don't know anything about it, but I think that render technologies in general have a huge impact, especially on eye tracking, because they are still also in the beginning of my research, I figured that out that there are still like lots of things that can also irritate the eye, exactly like you said, using a VR headset. For example, the depth is also just simulated, right? In reality, you're just looking at an HMD, which always has that same difference, same distance. If I'm looking like up to that mountain, which is in virtual reality, maybe like 500 meters away, my eye actually still looks a few centimeters away. So I think also all those render technologies have a huge impact. And if they get better and if they get closer to the way that the eye perceives things, also the eye tracking data will get better and the conclusions that we can draw on of them will also get better. Excellent. And one of the things we found from, from other experts that have talked to us um, about using eye tracking and testing is the, the, the most important part is that not only are, is what people are looking at, but it is if they're looking at an answer. Um, so if there's choose one, A, B, and C, they're actually look at A, they actually look at B, you know, whatever that, and that's reinforced through the eye tracking as an assessment. 
and confirmation that that is working and seeing how people use the interface and things like that um, based on that. So this is just really, I love your work. This is so fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to you. Awesome. I love the discussion, guys. Super interesting. Um, we still have another question from Matthijs. Go ahead, Matthijs. Hi, Leo. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I have a question about, um, well, basically you said that you have fixations and in between fixations, the user is looking around, uh, but not long enough to basically track, uh, or they're like specifically focusing on a certain point. Um, is there still something like data you can retrieve from those moments in between fixations? That's a really interesting question because, um, if, if you take my research further, you have fixations and in between you have saccades. So the eye moves from fixation to fixation and what's in between is a saccade where the eye moves really fast. And you can also draw conclusions of the sum of fixations. So depending on there are certain movement types, if you would not lo look at one fixation, but let's say you have a picture and the user looks at this picture and you would have like 10 fixations happening on this picture. Depending on how those fixations are connected to each other through the decades, you can also draw conclusions. There are like rules. If you like, I would have to also read that up again, but if certain patterns, certain ways that fixations are connected also give you conclusions of how secure someone is, how, how um, if he already knows what he's looking for or if he only like randomly scanning, actually also decades can give you um, uh, information about that kind of decades are also defined by the sum, sums of fixations. That makes sense. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Thank you for your question. All right. So I have a last question and then we will just uh, open up. We will um, make sure you can all unmute yourself and just hang out. Leo will be here uh, to chat. And I would happily discuss some more ideas with you guys, as I feel like, you know, we got a conversation going already through only the questions. Um, so I have one question left for you. So if you could do a research project again about eye tracking in VR, what would you research? That's a really good question. I've expected everything, but not that. Um, I think I would go more into, I would, Iterate on this, but think about how to um, make the VR application itself applicable for it. Because when I, for example, talked about objects of interest, when I say like, oh yeah, I want to see now if a fixation happened on that tree or something. And it's also really difficult because an object in Unity is like a closed thing, right? But in reality, stuff moves into each other, stuff morphs into each other. There is often no end, like a cable is a really complex object, for example, or a plug. And you also have to consider like, okay, how do we color those objects to make, to make sure that, yeah, like I, I think iterate on the design of the application to work towards this algorithm. And that would be really interesting as well. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. I, I really enjoyed this discussion and I enjoyed your presentation. So let's again give Leo some love. Thanks that you took the time to tell us about your research and shared your uh, knowledge about it with us. We really appreciate it. So, okay, I will make sure everybody can um, unmute themselves and yeah, let's let's hang out. We can get off stage. So Hello, for the ones, just, yeah, yeah, can go I on. interject? Yeah, it's me here. up here at the top, Anthony, the guy who can't control his microphone apparently. Hi all. So I'm another one of the people I mentioned at the beginning who helps run these events. And I just wanted to direct people's attention really quickly. For those of you who have been um, participants in our newsletter, the newsletter that went out yesterday was our last newsletter for this season. And then after that, we are merging with the Educators in VR newsletter. And that is just simply because a lot of our audience wanted to see what the Educators in VR other teams were also doing because there's a lot of crossover between them. So starting... Um, in the fall, we'll be merging with the educators in VR newsletter. So there's a board just here at the back if you want to read more about that. And there's also a board over there about speakers um, if anyone is interested in speaking or would like to speak. So I just wanted to mention those two things at the end of the event. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Very important information as well. Great. Um, yeah. So again, this is the last event of this academic year. Um, we will start again with new events with a 
new team or new team. We have new team members at uh, September the 6th. So I hope to see you guys then. And if you have time over, let's stick around and let's talk and um, ask you some more questions or discuss other ideas am among ourselves. So yeah, <laughs> feel free to do so. Uh, Leo? Leo? Paul, Paul here. 